I typically begin, uh, as you know, in, in years past, uh, I'll sing something what we just sang. Uh, I typically begin um, with the, the, the reading of the scripture, and I usually ask you to stand, but actually my primary text I'm going to get to at the end because I just feel uh, a burden. I know that at times uh, my style is more teachy, but I feel uh, as it relates to my assignment that there might be a little bit more preachy uh, today as it relates to stylistically and, and probably um, going to uh, in, uh, require your participation in that. And so um, just because I believe that the Lord wants to do something in us, not just something that we hear, but something that's in us. So let us pray first uh, and then we will jump right in. Father, thank you for your presence, which is here, tangible and evident. Lord, I pray that in the next few moments you would anoint me to proclaim and declare that which is on your heart. Father, I pray that you would do something in us that would transform us, do something in us that we would never recover from. Let this be a catalytic moment in our life. Let this be a moment in our life that we remember for the rest of our life, that this was the moment, this was the time in which you did something in me that shifted me and shifted my family and shifted my church and shifted this nation. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would do something powerful among us in the next few minutes. I pray for your anointing and as always I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in thy sight O oh Lord my strength and my redeemer in Jesus name amen uh, as I just told you, I really enjoy uh, teaching the Word, but I, what I have today is a little bit more preached than teach. I think um, stylistically, um, if I were to just uh, uh, share in a quiet form what it is that the Lord has given me to say, uh, it would not match what He's given me to say, and so I, it's going to require a little bit more of, of me and a little bit more of you as well. So, so help me set the right atmosphere by doing something that, that a lot of us abandon uh, after 2020, but we're actually going to do it now. Would you turn to your neighbor really quickly? You got to help me preach here. Turn to your neighbor and say, excuse me. I just wanted to warn you that over the next 40 minutes, you might see me respond in ways that are outside of my normal personality. I might get really loud, but if that happens, don't judge me join me. Hallelujah. Now, allow me, allow me to be a person of permission for just a moment. Um, in order for you to kind of get out of the, your shell, your, your, your pastoral shell, we, we all kind of have our, ourselves put together and we typically are not the ones who are loud and demonstrative and stuff like that. We typically will ask other people to shout. When they ask us to shout, we're like, yeah. <laughs> Y'all do that. Um, but <laughs> but, but I, I just want, I want to help us right at the beginning um, to just kind of have a place of permission because I, I'm going to ask you to give the Lord a shout. But the reason why I'm doing it is so that your neighbor won't be shocked when you give him a cry later. Okay, so, so just because God is good and he's worthy to be praised and there is none like him in all the earth, that he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, can we give him the biggest shout? Hallelujah. Now, I do want you to know, I do want you to know that I am not here uh, to stir up a level of emotionalism. You can, you can be emotional without worship, although you cannot worship without emotion, but that's a different story. But I'm not just here to stir up uh, a level of emotionalism. I just want to actually give a level of permission because I believe that we are in a moment of divine provocation. Uh, and so I'm going to explain that in just a moment. Um, um, when Dr. Frank expressed the heart 
behind this gathering, there was something in me that was already stirring, especially because one year and one week ago, I preached the theme scripture of this conference at our church out of Psalm 126 with the exact same phraseology of Eugene Peterson that he used in the message when he said, now God, do it again. And so we, we leaned in on the reality even of, of the suddenly nature of, of how the, the fortunes were turned and, and how restoration took place and was revealed in that particular passage. And I, so I thought I knew from the moment that he uh, expressed his heart to the gathering, a heart for the gathering to this moment, I thought I knew, okay, God's going to have me uh, speak out of Psalm 126, and it's going to be powerful, and we'll just probably echo, and I figured that Dr. Frank would speak out of Psalm 126, so I thought, okay, if there's anything left... <laughs> I'll speak out of that, uh, and, and, and so that's what I thought I was going to do. And, and honestly, my respect for the marriage of biblical scholarship and the move of the Spirit that here at MFI led me to believe that the Holy Spirit would have me share on the core passage that the theme comes from, and, and that all of you who are biblical scholars and PBC graduates and all that, you'd be able to say, okay, yeah, that, that guy, he's not, he's not emotional. He, he really understands the Scripture and, and stuff like that. So I thought, okay, we'll go down this way, however, as I pray. As I prayed about this moment and the closer the days came to being here, my spirit was and is at this very moment stirred up. Uh, there, there, is a, there is a reality. The Lord had me uh, prior to 2020, um, part one of my assignments traveling around the world was stirring hunger. And, and I enjoyed that assignment. Uh, and then from 2020 to, to now, the Lord had me uh, going around the nations preaching repentance. It wasn't quite as popular. <laughs> invitations got a little less friends start, stopped talking stuff like that and so I was like okay well but I'm, I'm going to stand on, on the word of the Lord but, but I'm, I'm so glad because today he's allowing me a pre-2020 message a pre-2020 assignment to, to literally provoke and stir our hunger in this room mm -hmm. this is not just a good idea this thing or a good conference theme, but as Dr. Frank said on Monday night, it is birthed from a cry. This word that we've been, this phrase that we've been saying over and over, now God do it again, is not just a good idea. It's not just something that we can write down and say, yeah, Lord, we, we just want him to do it again. We just, yeah, that would be awesome if you would do it again. And we want to see some things and see you do things and, and stuff like that. No, no, no. It, it is a cry. It, it is a word from the Lord specifically to awaken expectation. Because too many have made peace with disappointment expectation, the ability to see what God has planned for the future combined with the confidence that you will move from wherever you are into the future that God has planned. What the Lord has been doing has been a prophetic thing for the specific reason of awakening our expectation. He, he wants you to say this because he wants you to partner with him in it. It, this, is a, this is a prophetic cry that the Lord has literally birthed this gathering. He's brought this gathering for the purpose of a prophetic cry. Now, now there are many definitions. This, 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 this term, God do it again, is specifically speaking of revival. But there are many definitions uh, that are used to describe revival. But I just want to give a very simple, single, and direct definition. It is not an all-encompassing definition. It's not meant to be that at all, but it serves the purpose of this time that we have together. Let me give you this simple definition, but it's very important that we get it. Revival is the response of God to the cry of his people. Revival is the response of God to the cry of his people. I know it's simple. I know your pastors. I know you got it, but I want to say it again because it's vitally important. Revival is the response of God to the cry of his people. And as a result, there are some immutable laws that are connected to revival. Are you ready? Here's one immutable law connected to revival. No repentance, no revival. That is an immutable law. Um, understand, for example, there are immutable laws in Scripture. Um, for example, you won't see a harvest if you don't sow. That's an immutable law. Well, here's an immutable law as it relates to revival. No repentance, no revival. Here's another immutable law connected to revival. No prayer, no revival. 
no prayer, no revival. We said first, no repentance, no revival. Second, no prayer, no revival. But here is where I'm going to lean in for the next few moments. Here's the next one. No cry, no revival. No cry, no revival. Listen to me, family. Every historical revival has a sound. Can I say it again? Every historical revival has a sound. We've been talking all week about what we want to see happen in our churches, but let me just tell you, it will be difficult to see something happen around you that is not happening in you. We aren't asking God to do something in our church that we are unwilling to try, cry out for ourselves. I want you to understand, I'm not just the pastor of Deeper Fellowship Church, I'm the hungriest one in my church. I'm not just praying for my church to be on fire, I'm praying that I will be on fire. I'm not asking my church to come to a prayer meeting that the intercessors lead. I'm coming to a prayer meeting and the pastor is praying. <laughs> I, I'm just going to tell you before my time is done it might get a little messy in here but revival is messy revival is messy every revival has a sound or a cry somebody say that with me every revival has a sound or a cry in studying revival both scripturally and historically, I did a study on the cries. I, I, I've actually identified at least nine of them. I can't go through all of them uh, at the moment, but there is a sound that comes from the hearts of his people on the earth that gets the attention of heaven. For example, desperation has a sound. Desperation has a sound. On Monday night, Pastor Frank alluded to Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus who was blind, and he has what I would call the desperate cry, found in Mark chapter 10, verse 46 through 53. Then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him, but he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. And when Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling me, calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man, said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go for your faith has healed you. Instantly, the man could see and he followed Jesus down the road. There's a lot of things that we could say out of this, but I want to just say something very simple out of this desperation has a sound now I recognize that in our modern circles we don't like to use uh, poetic phrases like desperation and hunger and thirst we like to say things like well he's the one that satisfies your hunger and he's the one that satisfies your thirst so if you're still hungry and you're still thirsty maybe you haven't experienced him but can I submit to you that the dichotomy of hunger as it relates to Christ is this he's the only one that can satisfy but once you've tasted you want more and so there is a reality that if you have tasted of him, there's something on the inside of you that says, I want more. I cannot go back to anything else because yesterday's meal will not satisfy today's hunger. Yesterday's move will not satisfy today's hunger. I appreciate every single move of the spirit that has ever happened, but I'm hungry for what God is saying is ahead of us. I know y'all not used to me yelling. <laughs> Somebody said, yell, yeah, sir. <laughs> But there, there, there is a truth, there is a reality, and that is this, that desperation has a sound attached to it. And here, here's the thing, desperation is not quiet, and it is not hidden. I understand I'm in a room full of pastors, but the truth of the matter is, there, there is a reality that, that our desperation is not just something that is seen on the outside but has no sound attached to it. When you really need Jesus, 
when there, there's something that about him that, that you really need when he really does something when, when, there, when you recognize that only he can do what you need and that there's no one else that can do it when he comes close you cry out because desperation has a sound it moves you out of your comfort zone and it causes you to forsake normal because there is a reality even of those of us who are sitting in this room that we can say God do it again we can say that we want it to happen we can say that we want it to happen in our church but the question is how bad do you want it because right now the Lord himself is coming to say I am going to do something in this generation and in this nation and in the nations of the earth and I'm looking for a people who are hungry for it and there's a reality about Bartimaeus the closer Jesus came the louder he became you may say that's not my personality my question is are you hungry and are you desperate because if you are desperate you get rid of your personality something happens I'm an introvert and I'm soft-spoken but when it comes to the move of God I lose my Can I tell y'all something? I left my conference last week with no voice. And I told our people, I said, this is how you will know you don't have to leave. You don't have to leave. You don't have to leave. Don't feel like you have to leave. That's what desperation looks like. That's what desperation looks like. I left my conference. I told our people, if you leave with the same vocal cords that you had when you came, you didn't praise him enough. I'm not going to say I'm giving him everything. There ought to be something that when I go to work the next day or when people see me, they say, what happened to your voice? You say, I've been with God. I've been with Jesus and I gave him everything, including my voice. Are there any desperate people in the room? In the context of Christianity, listen, when you come down here, don't feel the pressure to leave. Don't feel the pressure to leave because the Spirit of God is here for this. He's here for this. He's, he's here for this. He's here for this. He's, he's looking. What, what pastors are desperate? What, if you, you want a move of God in your church, literally, are you willing to cry out for it? If you want a move of God in your house, you, you're willing to cry out for it. Who are those who are so tired of the enemy telling you what you cannot have? No, no, no. I won't let my body determine how much of God I can have. I won't let my circumstances tell me how much of God I can have. I will not let the world tell me how much of God I can have. I don't care what I look like. I don't care what I sound like. Desperation has a sound. In the context of Christianity, desperate people, you're seeing it right here and I'm not talking about the rest of you who are in your seat but just hear me hear me desperate people always expose non-desperate people <laughs> because the non-desperate people are the ones telling Bartimaeus be quiet in other words it sounds like this it don't take all that all that yelling you doing what's it gonna do by the time you get back to your seat nothing changed no 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 the devil is a liar what happened was I gave a voice to the cry of my spirit something on the inside of me needed to express to God I want you more than I want anything or anyone else hallelujah thank you Jesus hallelujah you can turn me down I got some feedback in the context of Christianity people will always look at you especially as a pastor because a lot of times in moments like this I go and preach something like this. It's the people that are responding while the pastors are sitting. But what is happening right now is that the pastors are saying, God, we want you. And we don't care if it upsets our church. That's why I love the fact, I don't know how long it'll be, but for the history of our church, I've been the biggest giver. So nobody can tell me, turn it down, because I, I'm, I'm I don't have to worry about losing the tither. Nobody outgives me in my own church. <laughs> so I, I don't have to worry about who I lose. I don't have to worry about who I offend. What I want is God's attention. I want him to see. 
I want him to see. I want him to see not only publicly, I want him to see privately. I, I want him to hear from me in the prayer closet. I, I want him to hear from me when I'm driving. I want him to see my tears. I, 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 want, I want the move of God more than anything else. And if anything starts to dip a little bit below, I'm like, no, 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 no. It can't be. I got I to gotta go back to the prayer closet. I, I got to seek you some more. I, I just want to be a good host of you. I don't want you to ever leave. I want you to feel like you're welcome at this church. I want you to feel like you're welcome in my heart. I, I, I know that you may go and visit some churches on Sunday, but I want there to be a place in Orlando, Florida called Deeper Fellowship Church where the people are willing to stay as long as it takes. Because we've adopted a paradigm. He's not in our presence. We are in his. And that paradigm says that service is over when he's finished. People that you're concerned about, they sound a lot like David's wife when she saw him dancing before the ark. But we can learn a lot from David's response. I want to free some of you in this room. I want to free some of you to a level of boldness. The next time somebody tells you, you look crazy down there, you, you screaming and hollering, what happened to your teaching mantle? What, what happened to your ability to break open? I, I, I get it, but there, there comes a moment when we become undone, where literally there are sermons that I have prepared, but literally I stand before the people and all I can do is weep. And when I start weeping, something just happens in the room and people begin to run to the altar and they begin to weep too. Why? Because it's not about my message. It's about the presence of God. It doesn't matter how well I preach it matters about if he's in the room so so David his wife she looks at him and she's like uh, look at you dancing before the ark of God you look crazy I'm sure you put on a show for everybody it's all fake you dancing out of your outer garments I'm sure all the ladies thought that was amazing. Look at you. And he's like, if you thought that was something, if you thought that was something, just watch. You ain't seen nothing yet. I will become even more undignified than this. You know what? You see these people down here? They haven't even begun the crowd yet. All they're doing is getting warmed up. There is a sound coming from the churches of MFI that people are going to begin to say, what is happening in those churches? What is happening in that region? They were one way, one day, but now something happened. <laughs> he's, he's like, this God who chose me, picked me to serve him, and serve his people, chose me while being a shepherd boy in a field. I don't have the attributes of Saul, but he rejected him and he chose me. I, I wasn't even initially invited to the anointing ceremony. I wasn't even the people's choice, but I was God's choice. Some of y'all need to hear that in this room because you struggling with some people who don't like you. You are God's choice. You are God's choice. God put you there. God put you there. God put you there. Don't acquiesce to the whims of another. God put you there. David's like, not only did he pick me, but his presence is with me. Now the ark is going to be with me after having been captured and returned by the Philistines and then sitting at Obed-Edom's house, if you think I'm going to be quiet, you're crazy. The presence of God is here. I've been called and anointed by God. I'm not about to fear man. Talk about me if you want to. Make fun of me if you want to. Call me loud if you want to. Threaten to leave my church if you want to. Call me crazy if you want to. But I want God and I want everybody to know it. had a moment in my church it was painful for me until the Lord spoke to me had a very prominent person at our church have an unfortunate fall and because of my love for that person I wanted to cover I didn't want to expose I wanted to kind of keep things going so that no one would really know and would just deal with it in private in the back with counseling and prayer and all this kind of stuff and God spoke to me he said don't you 
repeat the sin of Eli. Don't you ignore the sins of your sons and continue knowing that they're sinning against me and you say nothing. The cost of literally choosing people over God was the presence of God. <laughs> and literally, God was like, it's them or me. And so the cost of my leniency in that moment, trying to be the nice pastor that, that covers would literally be the presence of God at deeper. I refuse because I choose him above everything else. And I choose him above everyone else. And his presence is with us. Hallelujah. I sense that some of you, you've had literally your cry in a prison the prison of the opinions of people but I challenge you in this moment I know you're quiet it's about to get loud again I challenge you to praise him like you wish your people would challenge you to release the kind of sound in this room that you wish would be at your church. I challenge you to let's release the kind of cry that you wish would be birthed in your people. I challenge you to go first. I challenge you to go first. Don't wait for the sound, release the sound. Don't wait for the sound to come to your church, release the sound. Let him walk by your office and wonder what that sound is. It's my pastor crying out to God. It's the intercessors crying out to God. Don't wait for the sound, release it. Let it be a first fruit of what you're believing to see in your house. Let it be a tithe of what you're believing to see in your house. The altar's filled with young people crying out to God. The altar's filled with old people crying out to God. A house that wants him more than anyone else. A house that doesn't care about the time but just goes for it. We're going to have more time in just a moment. Allow me to testify for just a moment. Allow me to testify for just a moment. You can stay where you are. Before we launched our church publicly, a small group of us of about 15 prayed for three years together before we launched. We did everything that they, the church planning organizations tell you do not do. I didn't raise money. I didn't build a launch team. It was just 15 of us praying for three years. We didn't announce that we were launching a church. We didn't do any of that. The first thing we did was we took a map of our city, we laid it on the floor, and we let our tears hit it. And we had a singular prayer for three years. Not for people, not for funds, not for resources. Not for a lead team, not for a bunch of servants. No, we, we had a singular prayer for three years before we ever announced that we were a church for a move of God. That was the only prayer we prayed for three years for a move of God. Most of those 15 are still here. We, we did that. And then it's the underground river of our church for the last six and a half years. Our church has prayed together every weekday, twice a day, for six and a half years straight, unbroken. Now you say, is that everybody? No, it's not everybody, but it's about 400 people that pray together for six and a half years. 
at every month at 6 a.m. we have a prayer meeting that that goes on it's happened for the last three years plus in our live and in, in person attendance for prayer meeting pastor Frank was talking about where's prayer meeting over 500 people show up at 6 a.m. to pray that's all we do we pray and prophesy but there's no personal prophecy we pray and prophesy over nations the Lord will give us a word of knowledge. Maybe a pastor might be watching from somewhere. Though Just recently, the Lord had given me a word of knowledge for a pastor watching. I had no idea and literally talked about how this prayer meeting was getting ready to stir in his own house and that literally he was going to begin to see it happen at 6 a.m. And this guy sent an email like, I cannot believe I was just watching and he falls to the ground in tears because that was him. And now they've begun a 6 a.m. prayer. And literally, this is the thing that happens now. Now, there is a cry in our church. Now, I wish I could, and not, not for pride's sake, not for pride's sake, please hear me, but I wish I could take all of you on a plane right now to deeper. Because there's a cry in our church. There's a sound in our house. Um, but that sound is not my sound. It's not a musical sound. There, there, is a, there is a tangible hunger that exists in the people. And the thing is, the presence of God uh, uh, is so tangible that even uh, just like every other church, we experience a lot of transition uh, between 2020 and 2022. And I look out there and, and there's a whole bunch of new people and a lot of the old people, they decided to go elsewhere. And I did, at first I was concerned and I was, I was like, Lord, I'm, I'm, my heart is broken over these people, but, but the sound never left. These people that I didn't even know, they came in just as hungry, actually hungrier. How I know they're hungry is because it made no sense whatsoever. Our old people left, the new people came in, the sound never left, and the giving was quadrupled. Okay. Let me, let me not say that because I don't have the metrics. My executive pastor will be like, you know that one thing you just said? That didn't happen. But it, it, exponentially increased how about that listen I don't want God to leave because I told a fib <laughs> significantly God kept us and and what happened was we'd be doing our services and and our, our it's messy it's, it's just messy um, we we preach longer than everyone says you're supposed to preach Worship goes way longer than anyone ever thinks we're... Y'all, y'all clapping, but you don't understand. Let me define longer so that you understand the, the level of hunger. We just had a habitation conference. Worship each night was three hours. And then we spoke. <laughs> and nobody leaves. Because I'm like, okay, the American religion of football, and I like sports. People, people, they paint their faces, they show up in their tailgate, and the game is four hours long, and whether your team wins or loses, nobody complains whatsoever. But when we get into the house of God, we want to be out in 60 minutes, and we expect a move of God. You don't even recognize that you are bowing to an idol, but let every idol in the house of God be pulled down. And at the beginning, every other church in our city used to make fun of us. They used to make fun of us. They did. They used to make fun of us. Um, what happened was literally, um, I remember one particular pastor who I knew, I don't think he knows that I even know this, but whatever. <laughs> Um, one, one pastor, he, he talked and he, he said, because um, his people were all at, at like the, the restaurant and, and one of our members was, you know, family with the people. And so whenever they would arrive at the restaurant to join the family, they'd be finished eating. <laughs> and so he was like, y'all ain't got to God yet after all that time? It takes y'all that long to get to him? Like, it was kind of this whole thing, like if you really had faith and you really knew the way to his heart, it wouldn't take you all that long. It wouldn't, it wouldn't take you to do all that. And so they were talking about us. And it was all fine until people started rolling in with wheelchairs and walking out. I'm not talking about hyperbole here. 
I'm talking about real stuff that happens until people started coming in blind with a cane and leaving with their sight. Until people who were deaf started coming in and their ears were popping open and now they can hear. Until cancer started drying up, until tumors started disappearing, until stuff started happening, they stopped talking about us and they started coming over to see. They stopped making fun of us. Pastor Jason, come here real quick, please. Um, every year, and I'm going to end with a scripture, but I got to testify. Everywhere I go, even at this conference a few years ago, I made a, a, a deal with God, a covenant with God, that I would tell a particular testimony everywhere I go. And the testimony is this, that there was a family in our church who a um, husband and wife, they have 10 children, and went swimming in a lake and attract, uh, uh, acquired a, a, a brain-eating amoeba. And this brain-eating amoeba has a mortality rate of 97%, only four known survivors in the history of the United States. And so this family got this report that there was a brain-eating amoeba. The wife had it and six of their children. And we were in a moment of uh, revival in such a way where healings were happening so regularly at a church, we, we literally couldn't keep track of them anymore. There, there's a, a faithful lady who used to be paralyzed but got healed in the service. She now chronicles all of them. Y'all, I feel like y'all missed what I just said. I said she used to be paralyzed. And now she chronicles all of the miracles that take place in our church. I want you to be delivered from low expectation because I've discovered that in America, if I put a slice of pizza on Instagram, it gets more likes than an empty wheelchair. But the day is coming. <laughs> so the church prayed because what the devil wanted to do was roll seven caskets in our church. That's what the devil wanted to do. He wanted to say, oh, you think you're having a revival? You think all this healing is happening? Watch what I'm about to do. I'm about to put seven cassocks in front of your church and let the whole church mourn. What he did not expect was a historic response from our God. He did not expect that Jesus, who is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, would show up on behalf of a church. Let me tell you what happened. In 24 hours, a sickness that has never been healed in the history of our country. A sickness that has in the history of our country only four known survivors. It was his family. And all seven of them are healed. you to understand there are more survivors of that sickness in our church than in the combined history of the United States of America. Somebody say do it again. Somebody say do it again. I'm not telling fake stories. It's real people. It's real people. It's real people. It's important that I testify. I knew I had a limited amount of time, so I, I didn't go through a bunch of exegesis here and try to make everybody make, make it all make sense. I, there, there, there's a reason for this. Um, we testify, number one, because testimony creates faith for the future. Can I say it again? Testimony creates faith for the future. Because if he did it for one, he will do it again. He will do it again. He will do it again. There's another reason why I'm telling you this. Then I will 
give you two scriptures and sit down. Testimony creates righteous envy. Testimony creates righteous envy. You, you say, okay, what, what in the world is righteous envy? You, you theologians, you, your brain is going crazy because you're like, okay, envy is a sin. What are you talking about? Righteous envy. You can't put those two things together. Um, you probably are remembering with me, since it seems like an oxymoron, since envy is wanting what someone else has, you used to describe the sinful posture of the heart as essentially saying that God hasn't been good enough to you and that he shows partiality. So when you envy what somebody else has, it's, it's an indictment against your, your belief about God. <laughs> but Romans 10, Romans 10, verse 1, dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and the prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it's misdirected zeal. For they don't understand God's way of making people right with themselves. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. We'd all say amen. amen. Jumping down to verse 19. But I ask, did the people of Israel really understand? Yes, they did. From in, even in the time of Moses, God said, I will rouse your jealousy through people who are not even a nation. I will provoke your anger through the foolish Gentiles. And later, Isaiah spoke boldly for God, saying, I was found by people who were not even looking for me. I showed myself to those who were not asking for me. But regarding Israel, God said all day long, I opened my arms to them, but they were disobedient and rebellious. Romans 11, 11. Did God's people stumble and fall beyond recovery? Of course not. They were disobedient, so God made salvation available to the Gentiles, but he wanted his own people to become jealous and claim it for themselves. <laughs> God, in his infinite wisdom, will do things through people to show you what's available in order to cause you to want it. That is what is called righteous envy. He allows you to see something and allows you to hear something so that you will say, me too, Lord, do it again. He, he will expose you to things he is doing in and through others to show you what you're missing in order to cause you to pursue the very thing he wanted you to have all along. God wanted you to have it. He wanted you to have it. Um, one of the things that about Apple, for example, when Steve Jobs was alive, any of you have probably heard this, um, um, he doesn't make things based on what people are asking for. He makes things because they don't know what they want until they see it. No one dreamed up the iPhone and said, create, we need something that's like this. He, he created that and the iPod and everything else when people didn't even know they wanted it until they saw it. There are some things that God will do in the earth that you don't even know you want until you see it. <laughs> so can I submit an idea to you? Can I submit an idea to you? You'll never be ready for a move of God until reading about it or hearing about it elsewhere provokes a cry in you. You see, if you can hear me testify and something in you doesn't say I want it, you're not ready. If you can hear about what's happening in Brazil and in Argentina and South America and something doesn't happen in you to say, do it in America, you're not ready yet. If you hear about what God is doing in Africa and it doesn't cause something to cry out, to say, do it again, do it in my church. If he's doing it in your city, he can do it in you. If he's doing it down the street, he can... So here's where I'm supposed to end. I'm 17 seconds over my time. We got to eat. This is what the Lord is doing. You see, my initial text, I was going to read at the beginning, but I didn't read it at the beginning for the sake of time. It was going to be 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1, many of you know it, is a story of Elkanah. And Hannah, specifically, it highlights. And, and here's the thing about God 
that, that I love and I find in this particular passage of scripture. Um, Elkanah is a priest, and the Bible says that he marries two women, Peninnah and Hannah. He loves Hannah, but Peninnah gives him children. Now, the truth of the matter is, because he was a priest, he knew that children are inheritance from the Lord, they come from the Lord. So there was, a, there was a, a custom at that time, as many of you know, that if one wasn't bearing child, you would marry another. But because he was unwilling to wait on God, he, he decided to marry somebody else who could give him children. He should have known better. That's, that's a whole different message for another day. <laughs> and Hannah gives him children, but he loves Hannah. But the Bible says that Hannah taunts Hannah and for a while because the, the scripture says that this happened they go up year after year to offer sacrifices and so they're going up and I'm sure that for a while it was probably okay because Hannah had probably made peace with disappointment this is the part for many of us in this room we can hear about certain things happening in other places and when they're not happening in our place and we don't see them happening, we decide to make peace with disappointment. And we say, okay, apparently this is how God wants to use this church. And so what happens is this. Peninnah is making fun of Hannah. And initially it says that she's reduced to tears, which lets us know that just because you're crying doesn't mean you're ready for change. Just because it hurts doesn't mean you're ready for change. Just because it's not right doesn't mean you're ready for change. It wasn't until Hannah prayed. Prayer is the language of faith. Can I say it again? The language of faith is prayer. When faith talks, it prays. When faith talks, it prays. Because I can definitely tell you that what you're not praying about, you don't have faith for. <laughs> your faith is revealed in your prayers. So, can I submit to you this? I'm just going to summarize and not go too far over. Can I submit to you this? That what God did was, I believe, that it was God that caused Peninnah to make fun of Hannah because he could not allow Hannah's cry to go silent. He provoked her into prayer. He provoked her into a cry. You can imagine, yeah, you can imagine this. Modern day Peninnah. Look at all of our campuses. Look at our programs. We baptized 5,269,345 people yesterday. <laughs> you guys must be doing something wrong. Do it like us. Here's our pattern. Here's our program. Because you don't, you, don't, you don't have anything worth showing. You don't have anything worth talking about. Look at what I have. Look at what I have. We, we got 10 services that happen in 10 minutes. <laughs> they come in and out, and y'all over there with 25 people for three hours, nothing's happening. <laughs> and down the street, it's happening. But something in you says, but that's not what I want. I want a move of God, and I don't, I, I understand that a genuine move of God will cause salvation, it will cause exponential growth, like, I, I understand that, but, but there has to be a thing in you. I, I remember our first service, remember I told you we had 15 people, remember our first service, we were, took a building by faith, and the 15, like, remember I told you it was unconventional. We didn't have a, a lead team, a launch team, a serve team, all that kind of stuff. We were like, okay, um, you do the parking lot, the bathrooms, and the ushering. <laughs> you be the greeter and the setup person, <laughs> literally. And, and, and it was like, we're, we're all like trying to do, we're trying to figure out like how in the world did people come? And I remember it was time, time for service to start. And, you know, I was curious, but I didn't want to peek. I'm wondering if anybody would show up. 
because we didn't do all the stuff that people say you're supposed to do. We're just praying for a move of God. And so I was like, I don't know, maybe, maybe. And I was telling our people like, okay, well, if we show up and it's just us 15 and your family, it's okay because I would teach our people every empty chair represents a lost soul. And if we'll, we'll win the city one life at a time if necessary. And so that's what I'm saying. I'm like, okay, but I, I, there's a part of me that's curious. I, I didn't hear anybody stirring over there in the other room. So I thought, oh, man, it's like 15 people here, isn't it? And I remember I got, on, I got on my knees before God, and I said, you know what, Lord? I'm so committed to a move of God that if it's just these 15, as long as you're here, And I think, I think just to add a little bit of weight to the dichotomy that I was facing, um, some of you know that, that, you know, in the area of worship, I have the opportunity to minister around the world and, and stuff like that. And so, like, literally, I would, there, there's a, I would come from, like, Africa or something where you're ministering to, like, 100,000 people back to my 15. And so it wasn't like, okay, I wasn't used to anything, but, but so there were all these temptations to, to maybe, maybe, maybe we should do it like Penn and them. And then God, after all the people saying, well, you should have done this and you should have done that and you shouldn't do it this way and you shouldn't do it that way, that's Penn and them. So God used Penn and them to provoke Hannah to cry. Because there was a dual reality. Hear me. Hannah wanted a son. But God wanted a prophet. So he couldn't let her be quiet. There's a whole reason why I've come here to provoke you today. Because you think that do it again is about you. It's not about you. It's about a system changing thing that God wants to do in the nations of the earth. And he cannot allow you to be quiet. So he's going to provoke Here's my, last, here's my last point on this. I could, I could lean in on this for a while, but, but I want to let us eat and cry out to God. Well, in, in reverse order. There was something that happened. You guys are the first ones to come down, and I'm so grateful because I, I want to sow this last thing into you because there was something that happened that you must reject. Once Hannah was awakened to the cry that God wanted her to have, the Bible says that Elkanah came to her and said, why are you so down? Why are you crying out? Aren't I better than 10 sons? Can I tell you what Elkanah represents in this moment? Everything that comes to you to try to convince you that what you're crying out for is ridiculous. You're going to have to learn how to reject Elkanah. You're going to have to learn to say, I know I prayed for you in the past and I got you and it's a blessing and you are a blessing and I appreciate it and I appreciate the building. I appreciate the people. I appreciate the lights. I appreciate the camera. I appreciate all that, but I don't need any of that right now because you don't satisfy me. There's something that God put on the inside of me to cry out for that I don't yet see and Elkanah is not it. And some of you in this room are going to have to learn in order to find your voice. You're going to have to get rid of being satisfied with Elkanah, which represents anything and everything in your life that says, be satisfied with me. Why do we say do it again? Because it's saying something. It's saying we're not satisfied with the way things have been. There is more. There is greater. There is something else. We've seen something and we won't stop crying until we see it. We won't stop striking the ground until we see it. We won't stop worshiping until we see it. We won't stop praying until we see it. We won't stop crying out until we see it. Is anybody hungry for a move of God? If you are, lift up your voice and I want you to cry it until you get heaven's attention. I want you to cry it until you get heaven's attention. Until that thing breaks. Until that thing that makes you satisfied, it breaks. Ah. 
Come on, lift up your voice. Lift up your voice in this room. Lift up your voice in this room. I don't want you to forget this sound. This is the sound that your churches will sound like. This is the sound that your prayer will sound like. Revival has a sound. Revival has a sound. Release it. Oh, Jesus! Shut it down, King! 